In 1858, the Illinois legislature elected Stephen A. Douglas, senator from the state, uh, instead of Abraham Lincoln. A sympathetic friend asked Lincoln how he felt. Lincoln replied, like the boy who stubbed his toe, I'm too big to cry and too badly hurt to laugh. Well, friends, having just been through another election cycle in D.C., I am struck by how in the election season it seems like whoever wins the most recent election, generally speaking, every other person is bound to be disappointed. We can bear the disappointments like that, the disappointments of others well enough. I think it was Alexander Pope who said that I never knew any man in my life who could not bear another's misfortunes perfectly like a Christian. On the other hand, there are a few who are so given over to disappointment that they actually seem to thrive on it, uh, like Eeyore in the Winnie the Pooh stories I used to read my children when they were small. Uh, these people seem to take some comfort in the dark cloud that surrounds every silver lining. But for most of us, we get along just well enough for disappointment to feel like a sharp thrust to our midsection, to our hearts. In the Anthony Hopkins movie about C.S. Lewis, Shadowlands, there's an opening scene in which a piece of poetry is being read and the image of a single perfect rosebud being reflected on. Lewis says, an image of what? Love? What kind of love? Untouched? Unopened like a bud? Yes, more? Perfect love. What makes it perfect? Come on, wake up. A student says, is it the courtly ideal of love? Lewis, what is that? What is its one essential quality? And Lewis says in the movie, unattainability. The most intense joy lies not in the having but in the desiring, the delight that never fades, bliss that is eternal is only yours when what you most desire is just out of reach. Well, that may be a fine, artistic, romantic ideal, but is life like that? Is the only lasting bliss that of desire rather than of fulfillment? How can we have hope without the possibility of actually attaining that which we hope for? That's what makes the pain of disappointment so acute, whether it's an election lost or a business scheme collapsed or a theory disproved or a vacation canceled or some legislation defeated or a job prospect falling through or a loved one gone or a class failed or a sports career ended, we, we see the truth of what the book of Proverbs says in chapter 13. Hope disappointed makes the heart grow sick. Of course, one thing we can't overlook in all this is what it is that our hearts are set on so, friend, tonight, what, what hopes do you have that your heart is set on? That's a crucial question for each one of us here this evening to answer. Many problems come from attaching our hearts to things which weren't made to bear them. Some things which hold out great promise to us prove to be mere passing fancies. Others are actually dangerous and even destructive. In this old world, it's not just in politics that promises made are not necessarily promises kept. And this is where God comes in. God is the one who made us. He is the one who knows us perfectly. He is the only one who knows why and how we were made and therefore how we work best. He knows what things we should hope for, and those 
are the very things that He has set before us in His Word, in the Bible, so that you and I can fix our hopes on them. So tonight, we want to look at the New Testament. We thought yesterday morning about the Old Testament and its story of God creating the earth and patiently bearing with people who rebelled against Him and choosing a special people of His own, beginning with Abraham, and how His children, the nation of Israel, waxed and waned for almost two millennia until their once high hopes had almost vanished as their nation appeared once again crushed by an alien invader, this time a little over 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire. At that time, God's people were feeling disappointment to the point of despair. What of all their old hopes? Would their deliverer never come? Would they never be restored to fellowship with God? Would the world never be put right? All of these things have been promised to God's people in the centuries before the mighty Roman Empire invaded. The New Testament is the story of how all these promises made by God were kept, all of them, and the difference that makes to you and me in our disappointments and hopes. So in order to understand the New Testament, I want us to look first at Christ, and then secondly at God's covenant people, and then finally at the renewal of all creation. So Christ, covenant people, creation. I think you can be helped maybe by thinking about these things as concentric circles. That's how I've thought about it. First, the point of the New Testament, Christ, and then moving out from that, the people that He has specially called, gathered around Himself, His special covenant people, and then moving still further out until it engulfs all of creation. That's what the New Testament is about. That's the story of the New Testament. We begin with this question, is, would their deliverer ever come? And the New Testament answers these promises made in the Old Testament with a resounding yes. And in the very center of the New Testament is the focus of it, Jesus Christ. In all of history and before we read in the New Testament, God had planned to send Christ. God had a plan in creation even before Adam and Eve rebelled against God's rightful rule, and His plan would not be thwarted. Now, we thought yesterday morning about how God called a special people to Himself in Abraham, and He called His descendants through Israel, and about how that family grew to become a great nation, and how the greater part of it was destroyed, and the remaining smaller part was defeated and dispersed, and only partly really regathered from this exile, and it was this last tattered remnant, it was in them that this hope inspired by God of a coming deliverer and anointed one, the Messiah in Hebrew or the, the Christ in Greek, it's only among them that this hope remained. Now, the collection of 27 books which compose the New Testament begins with four accounts of the life of this Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is really what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are arguing for in their documentaries of Jesus' life. They're presenting to their readers the tremendous news that this promised Messiah has actually come. They're announcing this news. So the one for whom God's people had been waiting had arrived. So where Adam had failed, and then where Israel had failed and been unfaithful, Jesus survived those temptations, temptations that we faced, only He survived them without sin. So here is the, the prophet promised by Moses. Here is the king prefigured by David. Even the, the divine Son of Man prophesied in Daniel 7, He was come in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was the Word of God made flesh, according to John 1. Friends, this is where we begin 
if we would understand the New Testament. Just like we did yesterday morning, why don't you take your Bibles and open up to page one and then turn backwards to the table of contents. So you see there the books of the New Testament, these first four, the Gospels. Matthew was probably written for a Jewish community. He stresses Jesus' fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, like the prophecies about his birth. And Matthew includes five major teaching sections, showing Jesus to be the great prophet promised by Moses. Mark was perhaps Peter's recollections for the Roman and Gentile church. It was meant as an encouragement for persecuted Christians and perhaps as an evangelistic tract as well. It is urgent, fast-moving, getting right to the point. It's the shortest of the Gospels and maybe my favorite to use in evangelistic studies with non-Christian friends. Luke stresses Christ's coming for the Gentiles, written by Luke, this companion of Paul. Luke also has an interest in recording fulfilled prophecies. He stresses Jesus as King and Savior and seems to have a particular interest in recording Jesus' concern for the poor and the powerless. And if you skip down two books from there, Luke really continues this on into his second volume, the book of Acts, in which he shows Jesus continuing to be active through his church as it expands toward all of creation. Uh, Acts tells about his, the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost, the church beginning and expanding as God establishes his new society. We see the fulfillment of Old Testament promises to his people in Acts 15. It moves from the ascension of Jesus really through to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Then the fourth book, John, perhaps an evangelistic tract to the Jews, answers the question of who he is, the Messiah. Uh, this is what I'm preaching through right now back in Washington. And I'm, I'm controlled in the way I read it by uh, John chapter 20, verse 31, where John actually tells us why he wrote this book. He says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So friends, as we read through the New Testament, throughout it we're being taught that many different promises made in the Old Testament are kept in Jesus. So Jesus is the new Adam in 2 Corinthians 15, or 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the, the, the righteous one in 2 Peter 2. Abraham rejoiced to see his day, we learn in John 8. He's greater than Moses, we read in John 1 and Hebrews 3. Greater than David, we find in Matthew 22 and Acts 2. The New Testament shows us that the promises made had been kept in Christ. He is the promised deliverer. And not just for the Old Testament people of God, but for us here tonight as well. He is the deliverer God has promised and provided. And this brings us to the second concentric circle in understanding the message of the New Testament because, of course, God Himself coming in Christ can display His own image, but you'll remember that God made us, human beings, to particularly reflect His image to His creation. And this is the second focus, the second concentric circle of the New Testament beyond Jesus Christ. That's His special covenant people. So Christ at the very center of the New Testament, and then the people, as we pull back and consider it more, the people gathered around Him. Now, again, yesterday morning, we thought about this covenant language in the Bible, about how it wasn't cold legal language, but how it's the language of relationship. Well, what we find in the New Testament is that as we, as we recall when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, is that this Christ came with a purpose, uh, to make a new covenant in His blood. That is, to make a new relationship for His people with God. Now, I just mentioned that Christ was the fulfillment of the hopes of the Old Testament for the Messiah as prophet and king. He was also the fulfillment of their hopes for a priest. Remember in John 2, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus was the new meeting place. Jesus was the temple for this new people. 
Christ came to bring his people together with his heavenly Father. He is the mediator between them and God. Remember yesterday we concluded wondering about the riddle of the Old Testament. We asked at the very end of the message yesterday morning how this riddle of the Old Testament could be true, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. How could the Lord forgive wickedness and yet still not leave the guilty unpunished? Well, the answer to that, of course, is to be found in Jesus. Jesus taught his disciples after his resurrection, as it says in Luke 24, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You remember the Lord through Isaiah had prophesied this. In Isaiah 53, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And friends, this is what Christ did. Not only was this promised in the Old Testament, not only had God made this promise to his special people, but this is what he actually did in sending his son. This is what Jesus Christ did in laying down his life. He taught his disciples that this is what he'd come to do. In Mark 10, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Paul later wrote, when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. This Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a holy life, crucified, dead, and buried. As Paul said in Philippians 2 about Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And on the third day, he rose again. As Peter said in the very first Christian sermon in Acts 2, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Friends, there is Christ giving himself for his people, and there is in this the most amazing combination of of strength and of complete self-giving. One of the reasons I think being young is so wonderful is because you get to explore the glories of God's Word for the first time. I'll tell you one that I remember learning on this very point that was wonderful to my soul. Over in Revelation, if you turn over to Revelation chapter 5, John is weeping because he's not able to open the scroll that contains God's decrees for the future. And in chapter 5, verse 5, one of the elders speaks to him. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then look at what happens. 
This is what John has heard. He has heard of this lion. Verse 6, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Friends, he heard of the lion. He turned and he looked and he saw the lamb. Not two different people, the same being. The lion became the lamb for the sake of his people who needed a perfect substitute. Friend, you have to understand this idea of Christ's being substituted for his people if you want to understand the message of the New Testament. This is what Christianity is all about. If you're here tonight, you came with a friend, you're not normally spending your Friday night sitting in a gymnasium listening to a Christian sermon, we're glad you're here. Come back every year. But this is the most important thing we can tell you tonight that you, because of the way you've lived, need a substitute. You need someone to stand in your stead because God is perfectly good, perfectly just as he should be, perfectly right, and you and I are not. And because this God is good, he will not finally let any wrong go unpunished, not even wrongs that you and I have done. So we need someone to stand in our place, in our stead, And that's what Jesus came to do. The eternal Son of God took on flesh, and he lived a life of perfect dependence and trust in his heavenly Father. But he gave his life as a sacrifice, as a substitute for the lives of all of us who would ever turn from our sins and place our trust in him. God raised him from the dead, showing he had accepted this sacrifice. And friend, what that means for you is that tonight you can turn from your sins And you can trust in him, and you will be saved. He can be your substitute. You can be part of that second concentric circle of the New Testament, the people that Christ gathers around himself as he makes himself our sacrificial substitute. And this sacrifice must obtain its end. It's not a mere attempt. It's not a bare expression of love. It will obtain the end for which the sacrifice was made. So in Christ, the people are holy. The very thing that God's people in the Old Testament would never be on their own, holy, now in Christ God had a remnant, a people, a nation, a people to praise Him with their lips and with their lives of holiness. He had a new covenant people that were genuinely holy. The covenant in the Old Testament was real, but it was partial. The people must have wondered, would they never be given fuller fellowship with God? The Old Testament prophets knew this and had such a time reflecting on this and prophesying about this that they told the people by the Spirit of God that a new covenant would come. Jeremiah, I think of this especially, reported these words of the Lord. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Friends, the New Testament is all about the salvation of people from sin to this holiness. So Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians how they had been saved, and to the Corinthian Christians about how they were being saved, and to the Christians in Rome about how they would be saved. So so Christians are counted as holy in Christ, being made holy even now in our experience, and we will someday be actually fully holy in and of ourselves thanks to the work of God and His Holy Spirit. The New Testament represents the difference between the world and the kingdom of God as vast. 
This world is marked by unbelief. The kingdom of God by faith. The world is marked by bondage and darkness. The covenant people by freedom and light. On the one hand is death. On the other is eternal life. On the one hand is hate and fear. And on the other, love. Our lives, apart from being in the covenant in Christ, are marked by lawlessness. In Christ, we abide in God. This special distinction is what it means for us to be the covenant people of God. And this is what most of the rest of the New Testament is about. So if you look back at the table of contents again in your New Testament… You see those first four books that we've already discussed. These are the Gospels, the books of the good news about Christ, the Messiah that had come, Jesus Christ. The book of Acts then is the transition from these Gospels to the, uh, to the books about living as God's people as the Gospel expands outwards from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and with the three missionary journeys of Paul into the ends of the world. And all the rest of the books you see there listed in the New, New Testament are letters. And they're letters about what it means to live as this special covenant people of God. So you can even see in the order of the New Testament, it begins with Christ, then it expands out to his covenant people. The first 13 of these letters, written by Paul, a noted rabbi of the stricter sort, uh, who was remarkably converted by God on his way, as he himself put it, to persecute some Christians to their death. And you see them here basically in order of their length. You ever wondered why the books of the New Testament were in this order? Well, these, these letters are collected basically in their length. Romans, Paul explains that God is faithful to his covenant and that God has provided a righteousness for us, which we have accounted to us, just like Abraham had by faith. <clears throat> and then you see First and Second Corinthians, where Paul deals with this local church that he had planted and where he in particularly deals with problems about how God's people should be distinct from those around them. And in that second letter, there's a remarkable section where he defends his own ministry, a little bit like these wonderful films we've been seeing uh, on the Word of God. Anyway, then Galatians, uh, which is really a summary of Paul's teaching where he defends his teaching about Jesus over against a perverted, unbelieving Judaism. Then Ephesians, where Paul writes about how God is creating as he had always planned, a new society out of both Jew and Gentile in Christ. And then Philippians, where Paul writes about all the grace that God has shown us preeminently in Christ and about the self-giving love that's to mark his special people. And then Colossians, Paul wrote to the Colossians to remind them of the supremacy of Christ and their devotion. And then you see First and Second Thessalonians. These First Thessalonians is perhaps Paul's earliest letter. It was written to these Christians to encourage them to persevere in serving Christ while they were awaiting this promise of His return. And 2 Thessalonians then is written to clear up some misunderstandings that people were having about exactly what Paul was saying in his first letter. And then you have these personal letters after that, uh, four of them, First and Second Timothy, written by Paul to encourage a young associate in his work as an elder. Second Timothy is probably the last letter that Paul wrote. Titus, a letter of Paul's to another of his ministerial colleagues, this one who had gone to plant churches in Crete. And then Philemon, a, a personal letter sent along with a letter to the Colossians to an owner of an escaped slave who'd become a believer. And you see Paul giving particular pastoral wisdom there. So those are the 13 letters that are the letters of Paul. And then you have this second set of letters, eight of them, uh, written by everybody else. And again, they're there, if you've ever wondered, in order of length. Hebrews is particularly helpful for understanding what it means to be the new covenant people of God because there were evidently some Christians who were considering going back to some version of what they understood to be the older covenant that God had made with Moses. But in this letter, the author exhorts his readers that there were, on the one hand, the servants who, because of their own sins, died and who could only offer repeated sacrifices of bulls and goats to make the people ceremonially, externally clean. But on the other hand, there is the eternal, sinless Son of God who gave Himself 
once forever to make his people truly holy. That's what Hebrews is about. James, a little letter showing the nature of being God's people as being very practical and having a very practical concern for others. First and Second Peter, First Peter, one of my favorite books in the New Testament, if you're allowed to say something like that. Uh, these are two letters written by Peter to encourage Christians who were struggling to persevere in the faith. So let me just tell you, if you're a young Christian and you're a little confused, if you thought, wait, why isn't everything just going great in my life? I thought when you become a Christian, then everything just starts working out perfectly. Uh, if that's you tonight, you need to read 1 Peter when you go back to your room. 1 Peter is written for you. 1 Peter says, we're following a Messiah who himself was crucified. If we are following after one who was crucified, how can we be surprised that if in this same world we know suffering? Not suffering for doing bad, Peter says, we understand that, but no suffering even for doing good, because that's what happened to Christ. So how much can we be surprised if that's also what happens to us? Second Peter warns of the danger of false teachers that were to come. And then first, second, and third John, three brief letters written to encourage Christians in their lives of love and faithful following of the Lord. And then Jude, a very brief letter that's similar to Second Peter, warning against false uh, and immoral teachers. So friends, these letters in the New Testament, these 13 of Paul and these eight other ones, so you put them together, these 21 books in the New Testament are instructions about what it means for us to be the covenant people of God. So if you're wondering what it means for you to be the covenant people of God, read these books. Let me tell you another common error among young people today, right? The gospels are great. The letters, the epistles of Paul and others, not so much. I can't tell you how often I've found that. But friends, God's Holy Spirit inspired all of these. We've already thought in John's gospel about how Jesus taught that he was giving his spirit specifically to his disciples, not to sculpt or draw pictures, but to write down words on paper, to communicate truth, to write these books so that you and I tonight could understand the truth about God. I had the privilege once a few years ago of speaking to a group of missionaries in Eastern Europe. And uh, after some of the session, after one of the sessions, I'm standing out in a lobby and having a reception, talking to folks. And one person who was in charge of church planting for this group in a, a large city in Eastern Europe came up to me and he said, uh, thank you so much for your preaching of the Word. You know, God has really been speaking to me in my own personal times of prayer and reflection. And he's told me that this year I am to make sure that the churches planted in our city are planted based only on the words of Jesus. And I thought, well, this guy has an MDiv from one of my own denomination seminaries. He's in charge with this kind of authority. What should I say to him? But then I thought, well, listen, I've already come from America. I should make this worthwhile. <laughs> I didn't know the guy at all. It was the first time I'm talking to him. I said, you know, that's interesting. Actually, that wasn't God that told you that. That was Satan, who can appear as an angel of light. Because God, in fact, by His Spirit, inspired 27 books in the New Testament for us to learn from and for us to be guided for as His people and to establish His churches. And surely God Himself would not tell you to ignore most of what He's inspired. I won't tell you how the conversation ended, <laughs> but let me just encourage you not to fall into that same kind of error. Friends, the Lord Jesus Himself gave His Spirit to inspire these books. If we are Christians, these promises that God has made are kept in us today, and we see them explained to us in these wonderful letters in the New Testament. We Christians often pray as Jesus taught His disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever wondered what that means? You know, some people limit their hopes only to those things which they can promise to themselves, to things which they themselves think that they can make certain in their own strength, just to be on the safe side. But Christianity has never been like that.
not the real thing. We Christians have always had hopes that extend beyond ourselves and that exceed what we could ever bring about in our own power. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. This points to the fulfillment of that final and that first hope, the whole world being put right as God's plan in the New Testament expands from Christ to His covenant people, to the outermost circle, to His whole creation. And this is what we find at the end of the New Testament, the conclusion of the New Testament. Revelation picks up the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, but with some changes. So, Revelation is really the consummation of God's people in God's place in right relationship with Him as the church on earth militant becomes the church triumphant and the heavens and the earth are recreated. Now, sometimes when we get to this part of the Christian hope, people misunderstand this. They they see this as a kind of, of, of Platonism or a kind of Gnosticism where we leave behind the non-ideal forms, and that which was truly real always becomes present, something philosophical like that. But friends, what we're finding in the book of Revelation is these promises that were made earlier are now all finally fulfilled. So all the glory that God has been giving and showing is refinished and represented. So there is resurrection we see that Jesus' resurrection was only the first fruit. That is, in His resurrection is the beginning of the resurrection that you and I, if we're believers, will have part of ourselves. So our resurrection has begun in the resurrection of Jesus Himself. We see these interesting phrases like in chapter 21 where we're told that the kings bring their splendor into this new city. The holiness of God's people is finally complete, and they are with Him. The Garden of Eden, if you will, is restored. The presence of God with His people. Have you ever noticed how the heavenly city, when you look at it, you start counting it up, you realize it's a cube. It's actually square. It's a cube. What's that supposed to make you think of if you know your Bibles? It's supposed to make you think of the Holy of Holies. It's supposed to make you think of that place where God knew His most intimate fellowship with man. Only now, that has expanded into unimaginable proportions with the whole world as this temple then, the holy of holies, where we dwell with God forever. This is the great news that we Christians have to offer. Friends, that's where the New Testament points us to. The time we're in right now is the waiting time. It's appropriate that the New Testament closes with the book of Revelation. I love this. You know who wrote the book of Revelation? An old man. An old man who had even been forsaken by society because he was in exile on a rocky little outcropping in the Aegean called Patmos. And there, where the Roman Empire has exercised its might and kicked this elderly pastor out of his church, even off the continent into a little island in the middle of the sea, there what happens? This man in exile, utterly desperate and dependent upon the good of others in one sense, you could say, what is he? He is full of hope. He is confident. He understands that all the might of the Roman Empire, all the might of the world opposing him is as nothing when weighed in the scales against the promises of God. Friends, if you and I were writing the script, we wouldn't come up with it like this. But this is the truth. God utters this magnificent, glorious culmination of his promises through an old exile, just to make it clear, just like he would have his Messiah born through a virgin, 
he will make it clear he does not need human might to fulfill his promises. He will display his glory through our weakness. John was full of hope when he wrote this, and not because of one earthly circumstance. The promises God made about all the earth being filled with the knowledge of his glory would be kept in his new creation. Promises made in the Old Testament, promises kept in the New Testament. Of course, some disappointments have their uses. The ruins of our own cherished plans are often the steps to the true good that God has for us. You think of Paul's thorn in the flesh. You think of Israel's nationalism in the Old Testament and their hopes for the Messiah. You think of your life and mine. We cling to what we have in this world with all our might, but God has something even better prepared for his children. I love the way C.S. Lewis finishes the last battle. When he writes, and as Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Friends, if we here tonight are God's children, the conclusion that God has in mind for us is almost unimaginable. As John wrote, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And as Paul dissolves into doxology, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. So, friend, I hope it's clear to you tonight that the point of the New Testament, really then, of the whole Bible, is God's revelation of Himself to us. In fact, it's all about His Word to us, and therefore it is all about the promises He's made and the promises He's kept. And our response to him because of that, of trusting him. Why would we have this gigantically long record of his promising and his being faithful so that we will trust him, so that we will believe him? That's why faith is so important. So, The question for us is, will we believe? Will we trust? It's the nature of wisdom in Proverbs to trust God's Word. Abram, we read in Romans 4, is saved because he had faith, he trusted. So God gives His Word to us, His promises, and we respond by trusting this Word. Defend it as an errant all you will. And it is. But even in an errant Bible, where you don't trust in the promises made in that inerrant Bible, will do you no good on the last day. Friend, open that Bible that you believe is God's Word. Read it. Cherish it. Believe what God has promised there in it. Believe. Trust Him in His Word just like Adam and Eve didn't in the Garden of Eden, just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
we hear and believe God's Word. And so we begin again to have that relationship with God that we were made for. That's why we're drawing breath tonight. This is the hope that we can trust and should trust because this hope will not disappoint. And this is what the Bible, Old and New Testaments, this is what the Bible is all about. A trustworthy God. Let's trust Him with our whole lives. Let's pray together.